thank you all for coming. I'm really pleased to be here, and um, I give a lot of credit to Dave for being patient with me and my schedule. I know you've tried for quite a while, and I'm glad I'm, I'm finally able to make it. I'd also like to recognize a couple of my colleagues that without whom I wouldn't have been able to do this work and who continue the work. As Larry said, I'm retired uh, as of February, last February. And uh, although I continue as a fish biologist, as an aquatic uh, contaminants biologist, uh, my work right now on the Missouri River is spotty. I still have a lot of writing to do and getting this information out and into the scientific literature. Um, we were so busy collecting data, analyzing data, and making um, the reports that we had to make that a lot of it didn't get into the peer-reviewed science literature. So that's one of my uh, retiree tasks. Um, but Aaron Deloney, whose photograph this is and whose photographs you'll see throughout my presentation, remains as an ecologist at the um, Columbia Environmental Research Center in Columbia, where we did all of this work. Um, he's, a, uh, he's been working on the reproductive biology of, this, of the pallid sturgeon for mm, probably over 15 years and uh, has been tracking them all the way from Gavin's Point Dam uh, down to St. Louis and working with those in the Mississippi River to understand the link between the Missouri and the Mississippi uh, populations. The other person that's been instrumental and continues working on the Missouri River and the sturgeon um, habitat issues is Rob Jacobson. Uh, he's a hydrologist there. Um, and he's also the branch chief for the River Studies group that um, has a big team there for working on Missouri River issues and, and the pallid, and also the shovelnose sturgeon. We can't, we can't forget that it's also in, in trouble. So tonight, what I'd like to do is talk about uh, research that I started in about 2000, when very innocently we wanted to begin to understand um, the reproductive biology of the uh, pallid sturgeon on the Missouri River. Um, where was it spawning? Uh, at the time, we were um, tasked with understanding better how the dams specifically were perhaps interfering with um, the cues that the fish needed. But without understanding the basic biology, it was hard to fit in how the environmental cues might be disrupting or not uh, the, the actual spawning activity. So as a fish biologist and a fish reproductive biologist, um, that was what I took on going out, just measuring hormones at different stages, looking at reproductive organs. And lo and behold, 2000, 2001, I started seeing a lot of shovel nose sturgeon with an intersex condition. Um, as a trained fish biologist, I knew that fish were capable of this, but I was pretty surprised to see it in a freshwater fish. Most of the fish that have the uh, hermaphroditic stages are um, marine. Um, it's, it's a very uncommon condition. So fast forward to today, um, you'll see quite a bit of what we've learned and also, sadly, what we still don't understand about this condition in, in this fish and what we're seeing on the landscape in terms of um, fishes across the, uh, across the country, around the globe, that are popping up with an intersex condition. Um, and what does that mean? How do we interpret that? So let's begin. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about our findings for sure, um, but I want to give you a lot of background so that you can put this in perspective and do some of your own critical thinking. Uh, this isn't, we, we don't have the answers yet on any of this. And I think that the more people who are thinking about it, who are uh, making observations, as many of you are out there, um, 
And if you are fishermen, if you happen to look inside fish and you see things that look a little fishy, um, <laughs> perhaps you'll, you'll start adding some things up or at least making some, some notes and maybe some comments to people like myself in a research position that may pursue it. Um, so some background on intersex biology, what some of the causes can be, and besides some of the more uh, environmental temperature, those kinds of causes, uh, what chemicals out there can cause intersex? Because certainly they can. And finally, what, what we do and don't know. All right. So a lot of open fish, uh, fish gonad pictures here, which after supper some people are a little queasy about. Hopefully you're all seasoned enough river people that they will just go right by. On, the, on your left is a female, but nice uh, black-egged female. And on the left here, you see the testis of a male. These are normal, both of these fish, male and female. And we use the term gonocharistic for such fish that have a stable male and a stable female phenotype. Okay. What we've been seeing in the Missouri River, and because we use the shovel nose as a surrogate, most of the pictures that you're going to see are shovel nose. We have very few pallets, and you, of course, understand that they're endangered. We can't just be opening them up and killing them off like this. Um, but what we're seeing is testes with clusters of black eggs. Black eggs meaning that they're mature, right? They're, they're ready to be spawned when they're black. They go through phase colors, and you'll see some of that in a, in a few slides. But once they're black, that means they've matured in this animal. So we have on this, and in this animal, we actually have a testis on one side, and on the other side, we have an ovary. Okay. Here's some other examples. Now this one over here, oops, I'm supposed to say. This one over here is an earlier stage. You can see the yellow and the clear eggs up in here, but this is testes in here and fat. Also, there's quite a bit of fat there. I don't know if you can see the slight, um, almost lamellar folds, they're called. So there's folding in here, and that's what the eggs um, are ad adhered to. Here you can see the yellow eggs amongst black. This is because the mature eggs in this intersex animal actually resorbed the previous year, and so you still see remnants of them. Here is just the remnants. No new eggs have been um, recruited. So what we see a lot of different phenotypes. And I wanted to show you, though, what this, this looks like in the normal female ovary in a very early stages. Here are these folds that I was speaking about in here. And then this is fat. Oftentimes, we'll um, get samples from people that have picked up a sturgeon, and they see this fat in here, and they think that it's testicular tissue. If, if you happen to be one of those people, all you have to do is take the fat or the testes and put it in water. Testes will sink, fat will float. Really easy test to, to check on that. And again, here is the combination where we have the folds, and the testicular tissue here, a very thin piece of fat in there, adipose tissue. All right, after this gross view, let's look at the microscopic view. Over here, you see what looks to be an almost mature egg. This is the nucleus or the germinal vesicle here. These are um, protein globules, vitelligenin. And it's moving towards the animal pole here, which means that it's very close to being mature. Here you can even see the melanin, which makes the egg um, black. 
But juxtaposed next to that, you see testicular tissue. So this is what it would look like in those earlier pictures of the black eggs on the testis. A lot of times, though, we can't even see the eggs because they're internal and they're very early stage. And that's what this uh, photograph is showing. This is uh, a spent male, actually. All this is testicular tissue. And these are sperm here, but they're residual, meaning that they're um, from, the pr from the previous spawn and will be resorbed into the fish. And in, in there are some earlier stage oocytes as well. We wouldn't even know this animal was um, an intersex fish if we hadn't done the histology on it. It wasn't apparent um, grossly. So uh, even though we're counting fish uh, as we do necropsies um, in some of our sampling, unless we have a uh, established protocol for being able to um, sample the testis and look at it microscopically, we have to believe that we're missing a certain percentage in our counting. And a few more pictures. Um, oocytes along the surface here, spermatic tissue in here, the darker being the spermatozoa, and another picture over here. So that's what we see at the microscopic level. And I thought I'd throw this one in just because it's a little interesting that this is the adipose tissue that if you look at it, if you think about a cross section of some of the pictures I showed you, um, this being the testicular tissue and this is the fat adipose tissue. And in here we were finding the oocytes. So, lots of different configurations. What does it mean? That was the first thing that I said to myself when I saw um, these intersex animals starting to appear in our catches um, after I uh, realized that I couldn't categorize them as either male or female and had to put them to one side in my pursuit of what uh, the normal reproductive biology was of the sturgeon, the Missouri River sturgeon. Um, I started, though, becoming very curious about what these fish were telling us. It, I don't know if you recall, but about, about the same time, Across the country, um, there were being red flags raised about endocrine disrupting chemicals and about uh, fishes in the Potomac River, um, fishes in uh, the Hudson River, in various places that were presenting with these kinds of problems, but they were only being uh, observed at the microscopic level. No one was seeing anything as dramatic as we were seeing here in the uh, shovel nose with mature eggs and mature sperm. So this was um, a very extreme case of what other people were, were starting to observe on the landscape and what people were attributing um, this intersex condition in other fishes to was uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals. Well, I thought, well, if that's true in the Missouri River, um, let's see what we can find out, you know, start doing the, the usual literature search, search stuff. And one would expect that in the Missouri River, um, we would have higher near maybe cities where you have a higher input of um, chemicals that you might have over time. A, uh, a high, an increase in the percentage of males that had this condition as we've become a more contaminated society. And I was able to go back to about the 1960s when they first started closing some of the dams. And that's when um, some of the agency folks, the biologists were out there really looking at these fish, opening up lots of fish, trying to understand the effects of the really the, the closing of the river and the building of these reservoirs on these fish. So we had some good data. And because in these um, very grossly um, intersex animals, you see black eggs and white testes, we could get 
we could easily have people say, yep, that's an intersex, and quantify them. So we were seeing, um, picking up information in the literature in places like Lake Oahe, um, up at the Lewis and Clark Dam near, at, I mean, Lewis and Clark Lake up here. Um, there were reports later on in Nebraska and the Platte River and, and down near um, uh, St. Louis as well. Um, around Columbia, excuse me, and then, and then St. Louis. And, yeah. But there really wasn't a, uh, you know, there wasn't a good um, uh, set of data that we felt real confident in that, that we uh, could, could look at. So we wanted to take a snapshot of what we were looking at at this time and with, with the uh, Missouri Department of Conservation, we went out in 1998, no, it was in uh, 2008, excuse me. We went, we went and looked at, oops, excuse me. We looked at what the sampling, what the percentage of males, intersex males were, in a sampling of 15 males from each one of these locations beginning at St. Joe all the way down to Crystal City and then up the Mississippi a little bit. Um, and we wanted to see if that was at all corresponding with any known points on the landscape. And we did see, interestingly enough, a little bit of a bump up in the percentage, and so this would be 17% of the males that we, that we captured, um, down below Kansas City. Um, and then if you go down below the sewage treatment plant, down around Columbia, you see another little bump up. Um, I'm sorry, this isn't percentage, this is the number of animals, so it would have been here almost 23%, and here about I don't know, 14% but of 16 animals. All right, so we, we thought, well, maybe, maybe there is something associated here between inputs into the river and the distribution of, um, of intersex. Going back to that historic occurrence over time, um, another little piece of evidence was that there seemed to be an increase in the number. Uh, this is the percent of males, again, of the total catch that was intersex. And later on, our data was of the, of the total number of males. But you can see a, a slight increase from about 2%, maybe a little bit more, to about 7% here. And then when you're looking at the, just the number of males, we were up to 12% of the fish were, had this condition, which is pretty high. As a matter of fact, I just uh, read a paper on short-nosed sturgeon from the East Coast, and they're seeing just about the same portion of males that are intersex, kind of interesting, in the Chesapeake Bay area and in the Delaware River, and some of these other kind of contaminated locations. Again, what, what does this mean? Why do we care? Well, as I said earlier, with the understanding that endocrine disrupting chemicals can affect um, the phenotypic sex of a fish when they are exposed, we have to, we, people started using intersex as a bioindicator. If you saw intersex in fish, then they were kind of drawing a line and saying, okay, then is, there's a good likelihood that there's an endocrine disrupting chemical out there that, that's causing this. Um, we do know that it's not normal in sturgeon. There's enough biology that's been done on sturgeon uh, globally on all the populations, and especially in Russia. And they know for a fact that they should not have an intersex um, phase. Um, what we don't understand is what are the reproductive consequences of this. You're seeing males that have developed eggs, but they also have developed sperm, 
And we are seeing that they're spawning because we'll see them uh, with mature spermatozoa and then with um, released and their, their cysts are empty or near empty. So they are spawning. Um, we're not sure yet whether statistically we can say that it's in, on the increase. And one of the questions, though, is, is this indicative of other problems? Is, is this indicative of uh, the fact that there's been lots of habitat changes? Does this kind of go along with that? Not knowing the cause, we're suspecting that it's endocrine disrupting chemicals, but we don't know. All right. And the reason we don't know is because of the, what we call the plasticity of fish. Uh, going back to some early biology in how gametes form, we start out with a primary germ cell, the earliest stage of the, the gamete. And what happens is that this is bipotential. It can be either sperm or egg, and it will depend on its surrounding environment, what it actually develops into, how it differentiates. And what comes into play here are going to be both genetics and also the hormonal environment that's, that's in, um, in the fish's uh, physiology. The hypothalamus is going to be taking in the information from its environment. It transduces the sensory information and it produces the hormones the hormones then will affect the development, testosterone, shifting things towards the male line and production of sperm, and estrogens towards the production of eggs. And uh, this will happen naturally and not normally, both through the genetics and through the normal stimuli that, that occur in, in the environment. But we know that if you take fish from the environment, place them in uh, an estrogenic solution or a testosterone solution, androgenic solution, we can shift their phenotypic sex one way or another. Salmon hatcheries and trout hatcheries do it all the time in their selection for um, certain lines and development of a, of a broodstock. So we know that this is, what I said earlier, a plastic situation, and you can shift this one way or another. But, and so one would presume that also in, in the natural environment, if they're exposed to a sufficient amount of a estrogenic or androgenic chemical, this might also be occurring. But there are many other causes of hermaphrodism. And... One of those is senescence. As a fish, these are very long-lived fish, as you know. But as fish get older, their hormones start to shut down, just like in people. And with that, you get abnormalities in the development of the um, reproductive products. From my research, and I'm not going to show any of that tonight, but from my research and looking at the samples that we have collected over the years, there's no relationship between the age of the fish and the presence of intersex. So in our case, that's not, um, whoops, that's not been a, hmm, okay, my, well, <laughs> the, the next, uh, cause could be simply genetic ab abnormalities. Um, and those actually could be caused by radiation, they could be caused by hybridization, it could be caused by just um, some other uh, genetic trait that's falling through the, uh, the fish's line. Hybridization, though, is very relevant to 
the Missouri River. Because as you know, we have the two very closely related species, the shovel nose and the um, pallid, and that they are interbreeding. And in fact, hybridization, uh, although it's not been a very well quantified problem in the river, it is believed to be um, an, a serious problem because the species aren't, aren't separated well enough and we don't really understand yet what, um, what hybridization is doing to the, the pallid population. It's something that people really need to look at. From the, again, through the research that we've done so far, and looking at the intersex fish, we're not seeing uh, any relationship between hybrids uh, and, and only hybrids having uh, this intersex, intersex condition. Radiation, possible, but in our situation, not a likely problem for, for the uh, sturgeon. Diet is, can be a contributor to intersex. Fish fed phytoestrogens, for instance. Soy is a phytoestrogen. Uh, in hatcheries, you'll see some of the fish, be it salmonids, be it sturgeons, developing this intersex condition. But we're not convinced that in the Missouri River, um, in other uh, natural environments, this is a big enough factor. Temperature is another one. Going back to the hormonal environment that, that in, in which these developing gametes exist, you have um, temperature playing an effect, uh, having an effect on the levels of hormones that exist. Temperature is going to affect the enzymes that are in the pathways for the uh, production of the various hormones. And so an increase in temperature can lead to um, changes in the amount of hormone that's produced. This has been hypothesized um, as, a, as a contributor for the amphibian intersex that maybe some of you have heard about. And especially now with global climate changes, the populations that we're seeing out on the landscape that have intersex, the amphibian populations, are believed in part to perhaps be um, due to temperature. But we don't think that's a cause or that that's a, a really valid line of investigation for the cause of intersex in the Missouri River because temperatures really are pretty stable. They, they fluctuate a little bit, but not to the extreme that we um, believe that it, it's, it's a major factor. So we're down to environmental disturbances, which we know are great, and, and chemicals. Um, so I used uh, age and size to, to look at intersex and normal fish um, as a comparison. And I, I mentioned before that, that we didn't have any, any differences in those results, and, and I do have some, a slide here of, of that. Uh, our intersex fish are same, same as our normal fish. Oop. Ah, there we are. Okay, there's my animation. So what, what is an endocrine disruptor? I guess I should give you the definition of that. Goodness. Ooh. It's a compound that interferes with or changes normal endocrine function. And the important thing about these compounds, be it DDT, atrazine, bisphenol A, you've been hearing a lot about it. Um, one of our professors at the University of Missouri, um, Dr. Fred Vomsall, spent most of his career working on this. This is a plasticizer. It's the one in baby bottles and baby's toys that they're trying very hard to get rid of and in some cases have done a good job of getting them out. But this is um, ethanyl estradiol, the, the estrogen that's in birth control pills, okay? And it's very similar to normal, natural estradiol. Um, what's important here is the similarities. These 
polycyclic rings here, okay? That fits into receptors, and the estrogen receptor is what will um, allow the changes to in phenotype to manifest. And in fact, um, the estrogen receptor in the fish is very similar to the estrogen re receptor in humans. It looks very much the same. So when you have a compound such as ethanyl estradiol that's excreted, that's um, in our waterways, we know it's out there in fairly high concentrations, bisphenol A that's coming out through the uh, sewage system, nonalphenol, a surfactant that's used in everything, in your dish, dish detergents, in uh, um, a lot of um, pesticides use it as a solvent. These chemicals also can bind to the estrogen receptor because of their shape. Oh, this is fairly daunting looking, but um, it just, just to show you this pathway from the brain to the, the gonads, the testis and the ovary, and finally um, to the production of the oocytes. And all the hormones that are involved, this is the protein, the telogenin, the egg yolk protein produced in the liver in response to estrogen. Um, but it's, there are many uh, feedback loops here that can that interact between the gonad and the brain from, and from the environmental influences that are on the gonad. So there are just a myriad number of pathways to look at to be able to try to figure out what could be causing this particular phenotypic um, abnormality. As I said, endocrine disrupting chemicals, be they estrogenic or androgenic, can come from many different products. Um, and, you know, we almost can't avoid them. Um, they're in everything that, that we use, and as I said, they're also natural. One of the things that I did do was work with a, um, a geographer and, and, a, and a GIS specialist that was able to locate all of the wastewater treatment plants within a 10-mile buffer of the Missouri River. Now, these might be, you know, small town. They might be the major ones at St. Louis and, and Kansas City. Um, but all told, they're all contributing the waste into the river. That's one major possibility for a source. And then you have the uh, national Pollution Discharge Permit System that is another source of information of where contaminants might be coming from in the industrial sector. And you can see again in the shaded area all the points that lie and potentially are contributing to the Missouri River. CAFOs, we know what those are, confined feeding operations because of not only the natural and normal production of estrogens and androgens that these animals in high concentrations are contributing into the waterways, but also because of the antibiotics and the various um, other drugs that the animals are getting that are, um, many of which are estrogenic and androgenic, those also contribute to um, possibly to, to the problems that we're seeing, if in fact they're due to endocrine disrupting chemicals. And on, we can, we can certainly find there's no shortage of places to look for uh, potential chemical inputs to the Missouri River. Definitely plausible that chemicals are uh, causing what we're observing. 
One of the things I've been working on with some of my colleagues throughout the basin, both in above the Gavin's Point area and all the way down to the, um, Louisiana, is bringing together all the contaminants information that exists out there so that we can objectively look at where the gaps are and wh what information we still need um, to be able to fully evaluate the impact of contaminants on both the reproduction of the sturgeon as well as um, on other aspects of the sturgeon's behavior. And what we've done is we've gone to written literature, but mostly we're using the existing databases of the various agencies. And we're, we've, we've decided what a baseline or a acceptable threshold is from, again, uh, various sources where those exist, and looked at what, where there have been exceedances of that contaminant in water, sediment, tissue, and then come up with a, a, a risk conclusion. Is it a chemical of concern? Or is it a data gap? Or is it uh, not likely a chemical of concern? Do we, can we just push that one aside and, and not worry about it? So we've looked at things like trace elements. Um, we've looked at the industrial pesticides and the industrial organic chemicals. These are mostly very old things that we haven't, we call them um, legacy chemicals because they've not been in use and most of them are banned, but they're still out there. They're still out there, especially in the, not so much in the water. You see that there's, you know, very few do we see that exceed the um, acceptable uh, criteria for water, but we are seeing uh, much more in the tissues. Um, 14 of 140 fish had dieldrin concentrations that were of concern. 26 had DDE. Um, and we do see it still in, in, the, in the sediments. Dioxins nonalphenol, pHs. Some of these are really difficult to even measure in the environment. So we know that, that you know, this isn't a very representative, uh, very representative um, data set in terms of things like pHs because they're metabolized very quickly and you can't readily measure them. But we had to figure, we had to bring together this, this information into one, um, one area and, and synthesize it for those that are out there trying to determine where to spend the public's money. Uh, no. <laughs> Actually, this is in here. These are contaminants of concern. These aren't just endocrine disruptors. OK, to clarify. Chlorophyll A is, is not an endocrine disruptor, correct. In fact, pH isn't either. <laughs> but uh, most of these are. PCBs certainly are. PBDEs, which are the flame retardants, are. Mm -hmm. On that chart, the fact that a chemical is listed in the far left, is that based on the quality of the water that you have in the fish today? The fact that they're listed is because there were a, there were some data. The reason why I raise that question is, is, is uh, Florida and DDT and several others on there have been off the market for so long That's right. that there's either a lot of persistence in the sediment That's or right. some place because you can't get them. That's right. There is, there is a lot of persistence. That's, that's why they're um, still measured today and why, in fact, I think maybe the next slide. The Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services, every year or every two years, the, with the Missouri Department of Conservation, goes out and samples fish from the whole state of Missouri. And all states do this because the concentrations of these legacy chemicals and mercury, though, too, which is still with us and still being produced in large quantities, um, are of enough concern that we need to alert the public and let them know what 
that there could be health effects if they're eating certain amounts of these fish, okay? Relative to um, some of these contaminants, I've measured them. My hypothesis being intersex fish would have more PCBs, more chloridane, perhaps more DDT, if in fact it's causing the intersex. Uh huh. Uh huh. Certainly is. Um, whether it's being mobilized naturally or whether you're out there dredging it and pulling it up and disturbing the sediments, we, we, we as contaminants biologists will do cores in places of sediments. And you can, you can track back um, the periods of heavy industrialization according to some of these contaminants, as well as radiation. You know, they'll, all, they'll do that a lot. And they correlate very well with different periods in development of our, of our uh, industries. Um, but, you know, it's the same problem with taking out our dams, right? I mean, it's a great thing, get these rivers free, but what have you got piled up behind there? Back to our intersex question about whether they're causing the problem that we're seeing, though. Um, when I did the analyses to look at egg concentrations and fillet concentrations of PCBs and chloridanes, we didn't see any difference in the fish that were um, intersex, between, between those that were intersex and those that weren't. We saw the same concentrations. One of the important things, though, here, too, is that these concentrations over time have been coming down. You know, you see the 84, you've got high concentrations of chloridanes, PCBs being in red, chloridanes in green. They're coming down over time. They are working their way through the system, um, but they're still there. And as I said, in testing the fish, We've looked at normal and intersex animals. We've looked at brain and gonad. And we can't really see any difference in the concentration. So it, it's, it pretty much tosses out the hypothesis that these chemicals are causing what we're observing in, in terms of the intersex. Flame retardants, a much newer chemical, also an endocrine disruptor, been demonstrated in the lab with not only uh, lab fish, but also mice. Um, when we looked at the, the flame retardants in, in the fish, we didn't see any difference. That actually was kind of surprising. We thought we, we would find it there. So our chemical suspects have kind of these legacy chemicals have been kind of pushed aside. And the ones that we're focusing now today are the birth control pill, ethanyl estradiol, because that's probably the, uh, in the highest concentrations out there. Um, atrazine, second most heavily used herbicide in the United States next to glyphosate. Uh, an endocrine disruptor, although I have to say we still don't really understand how it works. It doesn't work like estradiol. It doesn't have the structure that would bind to that estrogen receptor and then cause the cascade of um, hormonal changes and then phenotypic changes that we would expect. But it does, it does cause reproductive problems and it does change hormonal balance, but we just don't understand how yet. Nonophenol, a weak endocrine disruptor, a weak estrogen, but one that if there is enough quantity, remember now, with, with chemicals, it's not, it's the, the dose that makes the poison, 
okay? It's not just whether it's present or absent, but it's how much is there. And not of all, there's a lot of it out there. Um, atrazine, there's a lot of it. Ethanol estradiol, there's a lot of it. And could they be working together? You know, could there be a synergy? Could there be, um, you know, we call it, um, you know, you have these, you have this diversity of chemicals that are all working on the same uh, system. Mercury, it's everywhere. It affects the endocrine system. And some of the heavy metals, not many, um, but one in particular that's used for uh, anti-fouling or was used for anti-fouling, they've since banned it, and that was uh, tributyl tin. Um, it was a great, uh, uh, it was great at getting the, the various invertebrates and mollusks off of the hulls of, of boats, but what they found in the Northwest was that it was changing all of the snails from females to males because it was highly androgenic. So there's, there's all kinds of suspects. Um, in our environment down here, um, it's, we're, we're, we're still trying to figure it out. This is a pallid sturgeon where we were actually putting a transponder in a transmitter, excuse me, into this fish to um, look at its behavior and follow it. And we, wh when they did the ultrasound on it, which is how we generally tell a male from a female, we thought it was a male, but when we happened to open it up, there it was that it was actually an intersex fish. Um, we don't see as many, but we don't open as many, uh, we don't open as many pallid sturgeon. Um, but we have to wonder with such a small population of pallid sturgeon and so much um, difficulty in trying to both restore the population and ensure that the population is going to persist, build up that population, even a few, if they can't reproduce or if they're not reproducing um, to the best of their ability, not reproducing well, then if there is a, an issue with chemicals, you know, there, we should know that. We should, we should try and, and figure that out. Um, what, with this particular animal, I think the question might come up, so I might as well address it now. We actually tried to fertilize it and do a self-fertilization test because here we had flowing sperm. That's one of the reasons, other reasons we thought it was a male, because <laughs> it was flowing. And here we had the ripe eggs, and so we did combine them. We weren't successful in, in getting it to self-fertilize, but um, they do self-fertilize. That, that has been found before. And as I said about the chemicals, we, in thinking about how, how the chemical could cause this intersex condition, you have to consider it's the fish's exposure to the chemical, how it's getting into its body, and when it's getting into its body and when it's being exposed. It's physiology. Does it metabolize it? With PAHs, the polyaromatic hydrocarbons, the things that are in like tar and um, in all the petroleum products, they, the body is very able to um, transform it, metabolize it into a very soluble product and excrete it. So it, it's, it's quickly um, gotten out of the body, but while it's in the body, it can still have some effect. The problem is it's really difficult to um, diagnose that by, by doing a tissue or even a blood um, analysis. You have to think about excretion. Um, you know, is it, in the case of fish, it's, it's not as big of a problem because they're in a very, uh, an environment that they can quickly dilute. It can be quickly diluted. And where, you want to understand where the chemical is having its effect. You know, is it happening in the brain? Is it happening in the gonad? Is it happening in the liver or some other organ? So these are the, the various things that you have to think about when you, when you say, okay, uh, 
fish X is being exposed to this chemical and it's causing this. Well, you have to kind of go through all of these steps and everything has to line up to be able to, at, in, at the end of the day, say, this is the chemical, this is the effect, and we feel very strongly that, um, that we, we have a, a, what we call a, um, a cause and effect relationship. It's pretty tough with when you've got multiple chemicals out there, when you have multiple environmental stressors um, to make those links. But what about these sturgeon's biology? One of the things that's really interesting about sturgeon, and, and I think as, um, I don't know, people that care about this river and its native um, fauna and flora, um, the things that are, that, that are really special and unique about the sturgeon also make it very vulnerable. Okay, it is a benthic feeder. It's down the bottom and it's built to do that. You know, the way it's shaped, that funny flat head of it that it's got, and it's sucking things up. It's eating benthic invertebrates in the case of the shovel nose, and, and in the case of the pallid, it's a, it's a piscivore eating high on the food chain. So everything below it that's eaten a contaminated something has come up and it's now having um, a bioaccumulative effect. But when it's young, and its gonads and all its organs are developing, it's also down there on the bottom, feeding in the sediments, directly exposed to whatever is in those sediments. Its age at first maturity isn't until seven, eight, nine, sometimes 12 years. So they have a long time to build chemicals in it that, that are fat-loving, lipophilic. They have a long time to build those chemicals up in their body and store them, and then actually transfer them to their gametes. In the case of the female, that vitelligen and that egg protein that goes um, into the egg from the liver, it goes into the egg, it takes all kinds of junk along with it, actively transporting stuff into that egg. So the hatching young sturgeon is already dosed, thanks to mom and her long life, and where she's been living. Sturgeon are relatively high in lipid. And as a result, that's why they've been out there like sponges, collecting all those PCBs and DDT and chloridane and all those lipophilic chemicals that we've gotten away from, from as a society because of that, because they're found in breast milk as well as in fish in fatty fish, okay? So we've, we, as a society, we said, we don't want these chemicals that are gonna bioaccumulate, go up the food chain. Um, we're gonna shift to other ones that are water soluble, that don't remain a long time in the body. And that's great. We should be doing that, but we can see the evidence that it's still, for fishes like this, um, they're still being exposed. They still have these contaminants in their body, and they could potentially be still exposing their young. And it's the young um, stages that also are, are quite vulnerable because they're developing, and because um, we know from years of doing contaminant research that it's it's the younger um, life stages that are the most sensitive. The spawning frequency. Um, so pallid sturgeon and shovel nose don't spawn every year. They spawn on a, females on a two to three year cycle, males on a one to two year cycle. So I said that they can download their contaminant burden into their gametes. Well, in between, once they start that process, you know, they may have nine or so years before they start the process, but once they started, they still have maybe a year or two to ramp back up. And, and have more chemicals ingested, sequestered in their body, and then passed out in their, in their offspring. So these very unique characteristics of a long-lived animal like this um, also make it very vulnerable, much more so than a fathead minnow that has a life cycle of maybe a year and is living up in the water column, eating algae. 
One of the other things about sturgeon, too, is that they're nothing like any of our bony fishes. These are cartilaginous fishes, and they're very, they're very old. We haven't studied them um, as much as we've studied the other fishes because they haven't been a major food source. Yeah, the eggs, the caviar have been of interest, but not even for us so much. I mean, it's been the Europeans that have really um, capitalized on the caviar market. So um, what we... What we know is more about how to produce a sturgeon or harvest a sturgeon for its, its egg mass. Um, we don't know that much about it as um, in terms of its basic biology. And one of the things that, as, as we are starting to understand, is that there, there may be some... Uh, ancestral and genetic propensity for the sturgeon to actually be more sensitive to some of these chemicals. It may have been an advantage for this animal a million years ago to be able to switch sex, to be able to self-fertilize. We don't know. But the fact that this, this animal and some other species that are also of an old lineage um, tend to manifest a more uh, extreme type of intersex with the fully developed, can you imagine? Here you have a, a male, but yet it has fully developed eggs. It has to have all the right hormonal environment for those eggs to develop and for the sperm to develop. So somehow this animal is able to do that, and therefore we think maybe at one point it was, it, it should have done that. And it's just residual, it's carried on along. And whereas other species maybe have evolved and lost some of that, these guys are still able to respond in, in a very, um, in a manner that's, that's obvious to us? Are they good indicators of something really wrong out there? So one of the things that I did as sort of my last hurrah at the um, Columbia Environmental Research Center, together with the Fish and Wildlife Service, was to test the hypothesis that ethanyl estradiol, the birth control estrogen, could be causing intersex. I took pallid sturgeon from Gavin's Point Hatchery, and I took them and I put them in ponds and I exposed them for two and a half years to the, about concentrations that we would see out in the Missouri River um, below a sewage treatment plant. And just this past spring, the results aren't all analyzed, but this past spring, we went and we killed all of them. And we, because these were, um, these were fish, I have to say this, <laughs> these were fish that were broodstock that were reared, I think in, they were spawned 1995, something like that. But their genetics were unclear. So we don't, the, the state does not stock anything into that river that they do not know what the genetics are because of the various problems in, in um, the fact that fish from upriver, up in the Yellowstone area, and fish down in Louisiana may not have the same genetic composition. And we don't want to be taking races of fish and mixing them all up. So these fish can't be used. They've just been used for research. So I was fortunate in getting a number of pallid sturgeons that I could keep in a pond that were reproductive age. And I was able to, through a, an entire reproductive cycle, a two, two and a half year cycle, I was able to expose them and test this hypothesis. Well, you're the first um, group that I've talked to since I at least had the results of what the gonads looked like grossly. And didn't see any black eggs. I was sorely disappointed. But at the same time, um, we don't have all the data yet. I don't have the microscopic, the histological data 
And it may be that at that level we will see intersex in these animals, we still don't know. We did see other indications though that they responded to the exposure. The telogenin, that egg yolk protein, it increases with, with an increase in exposure to estrogen and it was in the males sky high. So we know that they were exposed, that they recognized that there was a hormone in the environment and their physiology responded. Um, but we did not see the black eggs that we, we thought we would see. So, but we're not done with this. It'll be probably, we have quite a lot of data. It'll be uh, a while before we actually are ready to present that. So in the end, it um, comes down to uh, a weight of evidence. If somebody's going to ask today, well, is, is intersex due to, in the Missouri River, is intersex in the sturgeon due to um, chemical contaminants? Or is it normal? Or is it because we dammed the, the river and changed the habitat? Um, we don't know. We don't have uh, a smoking gun. We don't have all of those connections that I described between exposure and effect that you really need to have pretty well established to, to say it is chemical X. But we have quite a bit of evidence that there is exposure, these fish are vulnerable, that they, they are uh, certainly can be exposed to, and they're in the same places that the chemicals are, um, that the chemicals are getting in their body, that they are responding in some ways, the telogen, for instance. Um, and we're seeing other kinds of deformities and problems in the reproductive system of these fish. We're seeing problems like this, where this should be one testicle, one long gonad, and instead you see um, bits and pieces uh, of it. It's, it's, it's not one um, nice, well-formed organ. And we're also seeing a relationship, correlation between testicular um, size, the, the relative size of the gonad to the body, and the concentration of the organochlorine pesticides. So it appears that fish that have a higher organochlorine pesticide level in their bodies also have smaller gonads. So that's another piece of evidence that something's going on out there, uh, maybe just relative to the whole reproductive um, development, reproductive processes of these fish. We're also seeing a lot of egg parasites. And this is an interesting one because um, these are parasites that are specific for sturgeon eggs. They probably came over here when the fish originally moved into our rivers. Um, this is only, it's, it's like I said, specific for sturgeon that's found in both of our species. But um, what it does is it invades the egg and the the parasite actually consumes all the vitelogenin and then leaves the, the egg when it's expelled from the body and goes on its merry way to then infect another, another fish. So this actually can um, you know, destroy the egg and reduce the number of eggs that are out there. I've never seen it in, in a single fish that it would be even 5% of the eggs that were destroyed, but we're seeing it more commonly now than we have in the past. And we're seeing one of the most disturbing um, things in the river is teratomas. And teratomas are uh, tumors that have begun to develop in a disorganized way. In other words, it's a tumor that has many different kinds of cells in it. And the cells actually start to differentiate. So you might have, and this is, this is kind of a confusing picture, but um, all of this, all these lumps and these nodules, this is all part of this enormous tumor that had just bloated this fish out. 
Um, and these are in the gonads. They're usually developed from the germinal cells. And instead of developing into an organized structure of an animal, it um, has bone in it, it has cartilage in it, it has neurological tissue. Um, it, It'll even have pieces of scale. It's it's a, a, a monster, but it's and it's all just um, a confused organism in no particular in no particular structure. It's very very rare to see these in fish. In fact, whenever we find them, we record them in a registry for such tumors um, for lower uh, vertebrates because um, it's usually associated with contamination, just general contamination, chemical contamination. Um, we don't know exactly why, but like I said, in, chem in contaminated environments, they seem to be more prevalent. Here's another picture, and you can see the nodules a little bit better. Cartilage over here, this might be some neural tissue. Um, yeah, it's... Fat tissue, it's just a mishmash of stuff. I said that the uh, early life stages are the most sensitive. Generally, that's our concept. Generally, the early life stage is most sensitive to chemicals, be it fish, be it people, be it you know, mice, whatever. One of our students um, at the University of Missouri that did his thesis work with us and the Missouri Department of Conservation uh, actually funded this. He looked at this idea that the contaminated mother was passing on her contaminants to its offspring. And so went out and collected um, fish from a clean site and fish from a contaminated site, analyzed the eggs to look at what was in the eggs, and then did a, looked at a relationship between the survival of those offspring at, according to the contaminant levels in the eggs that, um, that they hatched from. And we see a, not a great relationship, but at two days post-fertilization, we did see a decline in the survival of those embryos that had a higher concentration of the um, PCBs in, in their fat. So we, we think that our assumption that these early life stages are both being exposed and potentially are adversely affected by um, the exposure from the, the maternal exposure is, is valid. So we're seeing it intersects in, in the two species of um, of surge in the Missouri River, if it's that bad, we might expect to see it in other species. And uh, I was fortunate, I guess, that our laboratory has done a lot of work on the Asian carp. And my colleague, Dwayne Chapman, would just routinely bring me every carp, black carp, I mean, silver carp and big head carp that he got, and I would go through those gonads with a fine tooth comb looking for intersex because I felt like it had to be there. And sure enough, I found it in both species. Here's a resorbing um, oocyte, and I forget which species this is, um, but you've got your developed spermatozoa here, and in the adipose tissue along the edge here, you've got Big old egg. So it is occurring in other species. It's not as obvious. You don't have those nice black eggs developing. Uh, you have to look at it histologically, but we are seeing it. All right. Well, we know that there are so many stressors out there on, on our Missouri River. Um, Overharvest, channelization, the dams. I think we do have to add contaminants as one of those things that we consider. Uh, overall, it's gotta be really, it's gotta be strategically looked at, it's gotta be thought out carefully how many of our resources we put towards the contaminant issue, um, how many resources do we put towards habitat issues. You, we can't, 
you know, what, what are we going to do about contaminants? It's, it's, if it's a pervasive problem throughout the system, um, non-point sources, habitat, you can go out and fix. What are we going to do about the sediments that are contaminated? Well, a few things. If we do understand that, in fact, if we know that contaminants are reducing survival of the, of the young, maybe we don't want to be out there dredging things up. Maybe we don't want to be, you know, making side channels and putting all that sediment into the river because it may have stuff in it. Um, maybe we need to be careful about where we stock our brood stock, the fish that we let go. We don't, we don't know if they return to the place that they're planted, but if they did and we planted them in a place that was a, a super fun site and they come back there to spawn, you know, that's probably not a good idea for, for the um, preservation of the, of the population. So contaminants has an important role. We do need to understand um, that role and manage appropriately but it's a, it's a heck of a big question. And um, there's a lot of research on, on the effects of contaminants and what it means for the reproduction of fish and on this indicator, supposed indicator of intersex, um, on a lot of species throughout the world, really. Um, our sturgeon may be particularly special in that they're showing us um, you know, that we've got a very disturbed system and that we have contaminants in it that um, are affecting them. What we don't understand yet is how badly what those are and whether the contaminants are affecting the populations. Those are some of the, the really big questions that we, we still need to answer. Great. Well, thank you for coming. And <laughs> thank you for